Hello, I'm Mary Spicer, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Behind Fashion. In these unprecedented times, the fashion industry, like many other industries, is in distress. Around the world, we have joined together to demand racial and social justice. No industry is exempt, and the hard work must continue. I created this series so that we could support one another moving forward in the new fashion world. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to introduce you to many people behind the scenes of fashion, from producers to designers, choreographers, models, and so many more. If you have any questions during this, you can certainly ask me on the webinar or email me, mary at jamproductionsco.com. With a virus that discourages the interaction of people, the touching of clothing, how are the fashion shows going to evolve? What are our roles at that time? And how is fashion going to be um, changed into its design as we move forward? I look forward to collaborating with you um, and sharing our journeys as we go into this new fashion world. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce all of you to Kavana Baker. Kavana was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, she first became interested in fashion at 12 years old, um, shopping her mother's closet, and um, this influence of timeless luxury continued to be a part of her aesthetic. And I have a photo of her and her mother here. And you know, this is how we start when you're, you're young, you're looking up to people, what are they wearing, what is the style, and this is her great influence and her start into fashion. Um, graduating from high school, Spain Park High School, she does credit her teacher, Michelle Copeland, and her principal, Billy Broadway, for agreeing to let her do her independent study in fashion design. That meant that during high school, she taught herself to cut the fabric, sew, create patterns, learning the behavior of the fabrics, what happens when you wash them, all of that, preparing her for a future as a fashion designer. Um, she attended SCAD, which is Savannah College of Art and Design, and graduated with a Bachelor in Fine Art um, in Fashion Design. Her senior collection was based on the poem by Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven, and it was chosen as one of the few collections in the senior fashion show. This is really a big deal. There are a few grads and only a handful of seniors that are allowed in the show. And here are some of her looks. The show is overseen by Miss Gay Alexander and attended by many top industry professionals like SCAD board member Andre Leon Kelly and media's own Women's Wear Daily and Fashionista. Two of her pieces were chosen from this collection to be displayed in the SCAD Fashion Museum of Fashion and Film in Atlanta, Georgia, with one look presented alongside the Oscar de la Renta collection. It was the largest to date. And additionally, this collection was shown at the first ever SCAD Fashion Showcase in Hong Kong and on display at SCAD itself for the year. Following graduation, there was no time for Kavanaugh. She went straight to work as an apprentice designer at Reebok in Boston, Massachusetts. After just one year, she decided it was time to strike out on her own with her own namesake brand. Kavana Baker is a rising name in luxury designer wear. Her pieces showcase a unique boldness focusing on individuality, textures, and silhouettes. All of Kavana's garments are sourced from textiles in France, Spain, and Italy, and all pieces are made in New York City. She has dressed celebrities such as Heidi Klum, and I have Heidi here. You may know her from Project Runway and as a model. She has also dressed Nomzamo Bata and Nomzamo, beautiful outfit. She was just in the BET Awards. It was um, done virtually. She hosted, attended, and she presented the Viewer's Choice Award for New International Act. Just a gorgeous photo. And I, I am so visual, so I wanted to share photos. Um, sometimes I talk about these things, but I think that seeing it is, is just making so much more impact. She's also dressed Lucy Hale, 
Camila Mendez, Laura Morano, and Ming Nawen. And I, Laura and Ming Nawen are shown here. Um, if you don't know Laura, she was in Disney's Austin and Alley, Super Bad and Lady Bird. And Ming Nawen was in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and she is the voice of Mulan in one and two. Uh, she has dressed Angela Bassett, Wendy, Wendy Williams, Brandy Cyrus. Brandy Cyrus is a DJ. Many of us are familiar with her sister. Um, but here she is on New Year's Eve in this piece. This is one of two that she has worn that evening. Um, we also, she's also dressed Gina Rodriguez, who was the voice of Carmen Sandiego and is um, Jane the Virgin. <laughs> And then she's also dressed Danielle Jonas. Now this is only a few, these are the few pictures that I picked. Now there's that guy, Kevin, but uh, Danielle just looks fabulous in that bralette and, um, and coat, the Brooklyn coat it is. Um, Kavanaugh's designs have been featured in Women's Wear Daily, Fashionista, The Bachelor, Elle, Condé Nast Traveler, New York Times. Her pieces have been seen on Alicia Witt in AMC's The Walking Dead, the band's Little Big Town's own Karen Fairchild, and top recording artists such as Carrie Underwood, Marin Morris, and she did her wedding gown, Karen Fairchild, Kimberly Schlopman of Little Big Town, Miranda Lambert, Kelsey Ballerini, Shania Twain, Danielle Bradbury, and Becky G. Although she started as a custom designs only brand, her collection has quickly grown to offer a ready-to-wear line. Luxury, drama, and glamour are the visual hallmarks of the designs of Kavanaugh Baker. She designs everyday wear for women who still practice the fine art of dressing. Welcome, Kavanaugh, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Behind Fashion. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> I can, yeah. I mean, I just, I love all those photos. It was so hard to pick which person. You've dressed so many celebrities, and all of the designs are just really fabulous. I absolutely love it. Now, I sent you a mug. Did you receive that? I did, right here. You know, we rarely get to cheers and celebrate the moment of where we are. We're always looking to the future in fashion. I just wanted to celebrate you and all that you have done up to this point. Congratulations. Cheers. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit, before I go into all of this loveliness, all of your fabulous designs that I just go gaga over, and um, I love them so much, but I just want to check in with you and how you're doing. You did test positive for COVID-19, and it's been, it's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a while. It was one of the first cases of covid um, so I tested in early March, and uh, it was a sh long road. I tested positive twice, 14 days apart, so the virus stayed in my system for a little bit, and, um, you know, I developed, like, pneumonia and all the additional things that you don't want to develop from the virus, and uh, since then, I have been in and out of doctor's offices and trying to figure out <laughs> what's all going on and um i've been diagnosed with pericarditis which is swelling of the heart um pleurisy which is swelling of the lungs and then a blood clot and so i am just now free and clear off of all those medicines so it's just trying to get back um my lungs into like a good cardio shape at this point yeah you know getting that energy back up and you put a photo on um up of yourself I think that was when you said I'm after 24 days of trying to find a hospital who would treat my COVID-19 complications correctly, I found a cardiologist through a friend. And this is you getting, um, uh, you had chest pains and tightness. Um, so that's something that a lot of people don't talk about is that you, you tested positive, you had it for over 14 days, well over 14 days, you still didn't feel well. And I think you were telling me that the nurses and doctors just didn't really want you to come into the offices. Yeah, so like in the hospital itself, I ended up in the ER from like low oxygen levels. Um, when I got in, it was down, like the O2 was down to uh, like, I think in the seventies and they wouldn't even put me on oxygen. They just like left me in a room. They just like walked out and left. 
Uh, it was very interesting. I had like the ER doctor who had put the IV in me, put it in wrong. So my arm was swollen and bruised. I couldn't get anyone to come to me to help me. And then once they like transferred me into like my hospital room, the doctor, I mean, the nurses were fighting and they were like, we don't want her on this level, like take her somewhere else. And then I was in the hospital for two days and I could not get a single doctor in the hospital to come see me. I couldn't get any treatment. I was placed there for heart attack symptoms. And what's ironic about it is uh, my like doctor that was handling my COVID case um, sent out, sent out like an emergency, like, you know, young 27 year old with COVID having like heart attack symptoms. Um, we need like an emergency echo and CT scan and the hospital I went to responded and they were like, send her here. We'll, we'll get her done. Well, when I got there, they were like, yeah, no, no hospitals are doing that. Don't worry about it. Like, you're just going to sit here. And, um, I finally left the hospital. I checked myself out of the hospital. They told me I didn't need to, but I was like, why, why would I stay if y'all aren't going to do anything? Like if, if I'm really going to die here, I'm not, I don't want to die here. So it was, it was very frustrating because, and my personal opinion is the reason so many people were dying in the beginning is because doctors and nurses in hospitals just kind of threw people to the side and they refused to treat them. It's, there was that, there was overwhelming number of people in New York, but you know, you would think that it's better now, but just last night on the news, there was a nurse who came on and, and she said, I'm a nurse and they don't want to treat us. They're afraid. Um, we are coming down with it. We are getting sick. Some of us are dying, doctors and nurses. Um, we just don't know how it's fully behaving. And so we're not getting treated properly and you've really got to fight for it. So it is still happening now. Oh yeah. And it doesn't surprise me. I mean, the response they got, they were like, you know, we would do, if you weren't a COVID patient and you came in with these symptoms, we'd give you an echo and a CT scan. Um, but since you have COVID, we can't put you in those rooms because it'll take too long to disinfect for other patients that don't have the virus. Cause I was one of the few people in there. I think there was like maybe two other people in that hospital that had it. Um, so in my opinion, the hospital answered my call so they could get a little bit of extra money for having a COVID patient in there. Wow. It was very, very frustrating. And then on top of that, um, once I was cleared of the virus, it took, like you said, 24 days for a doctor to finally see me. And that was because I was very vocal on social media mm -hmm. and a doctor that works within that doctor's practice was like, you have to see her and made the right. call and got me in. And that doctor kind of like wrote me off pretty soon. Um, he put me on like high doses of aspirin and I started bruising really, really bad in my chest and my pain wasn't going away. And he was like, well, it's not pericarditis, it's something else. I'm gonna hook you, it's a uh, pinch nerve. I'll hook you up with a, um, with a neurologist. I was like, wait a minute. Like, so my heart, is, like my chest symptoms you're saying is a, like a, a spinal issue. I like, it didn't make sense. so. I had posted about that and um, one of my clients, her husband is actually a cardiologist here in Nashville and they reached out and they were like, no, come see us. And he has done everything. And he hooked me up with a um, pulmonologist on top of it. He did all the CT scans, all the different scans that they do to try to find blood clots and everything. And he got me on my pericarditis medicine. If it wasn't for him, I mean, I could probably still be in pain today, but um, he's the one that really, really helped. Or worse, and it and it and it isn't just the cold. It does behave differently. Some people, it's nothing at all. But when you have something, you get the coagulation of the blood, and and all of these symptoms that you're having, young or old, it is it is not a good thing to have. And so masks are so important. I did see that you um you have masks on your website, and the love mask. You, I mentioned this before, and the Charmeuse uh, kerchief mask. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> gorgeous and they're both sold out um are you going to bring those back on or are you making different masks at this point so right now what we're doing with the mask is the masks are all from fabric waste so what that means is that it comes from a manufacturing run or a sample run or something we've done custom and it's the spare fabric in between cutting out the pattern pieces to sew the garment so what we're doing is not only are we a sustainable company now, but we're making our sustainability even more effective by using the scrap fabrics to make these masks and the scrap trims that we have. So everything that we're using is stuff that has been available in our studio. 
And so right. certain pieces, when they sell out, we necessarily can't bring them back in because, you know, either the fabric's gone. Like, I mean, when, once we sell something out, it's not like because we only made like 20 of them and we don't want to make another. It's because there's literally no more fabric. And so, um, and, and what we're doing is uh, trying to use and keep our brand as sustainable as possible. But with that, as different masks begin to sell out, we'll develop new masks with different fabrics we have within the collection and then re-put those online. So you could probably check about once a month and there might be a new style of mask up or a new fabrication, a new application that we're doing on the masks. I love them. They're so creative. And there was one that really caught my eye. It's, it's like it's a cowl that goes over and it has mm -hmm. um, a necklace with it. And so I could wear it with my outfit right now and it would look like part of my outfit and I'm wearing a necklace. It's, it's just so gorgeous. Um, thinking about that and the matching and, you know, I mean, if I'm just running to the bathroom, let's say I went somewhere and I'm running to the bathroom, I think nobody's there. You know, I don't have time to reach into my pocket or into my purse for a mask. I have it right around my neck. Just pull it right up. Oh, somebody, somebody's walking by that I didn't yeah. expect. I can just put it right up. I don't have to worry. And it comes right back down and it's nice and loose. So it doesn't ruin my lipstick or anything. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I am fashion, but um, do you have plans to, um, sell masks in full outfits. So the masks match the outfits and maybe even kind of just like go into the outfit so you don't notice as much. So like I said, with the pieces being from previous collections and scrap fabrics, a lot of our masks match pieces that we've already sold or are online now. So like the bird one that you were saying that you liked that ties up and around that actually matches a very lightweight maxi gown that is sold out on our website. That piece is sold out, but it matched that dress perfectly. A lot of these fabrics, if you have one of our jackets or one of our blouses or something like that, the fabric matches the item. And so also since we're a small batch brand, a lot of our pieces sell out. And since, you know, the pandemic is new, <laughs> you know, some pieces might already be currently sold out um, while we're introducing the mask. But uh, moving forward and new collections, if these masks uh, mandates are still around, we'll develop them to go with new outfits. Right. Well, I, I just love it. And I love that we're going to start incorporating them into our fashions as we know the masks are a huge part of resolving all of this. And you've always had, just to kind of keep going forward, you've always had your clothing um, made in New York, which anyone in fashion design production, they all know this is an expensive thing to do relatively to sending it overseas. As a young and new designer, right from the get-go, you decided this was important. Can you tell me about making that decision? You know, it has a lot to do with quality. I'm a big kind of like, let's stimulate our own economy kind of person. Um, so anything that we can do within the U.S., I prefer to do within the U.S. and not outsource elsewhere. Um, and I think that manufacturing is something that like needs to come back to the United States and it'll help people with jobs. And um, so one thing that I've always wanted to do is make sure that we have a collection that's made in New York City because it's also, it's a dying trade in the US. Being able to learn how to make those garments and make quality, use novelty fabrics because everyone's going overseas. And I understand why that's happening because it is significantly cheaper to produce over in China and in the Asia countries. And that's a business decision and everything's based off of business. But for me, I, I like the idea of training these people to keep the craft going and I mean, it's the same thing with Paris, those couture houses, there's, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And like those couture seamstresses, I mean, it's a long time to be able to get to that establishment and it to like that level of sewing and creation. And it's, it's a dying, um, it's a dark dying trade over there too. So one thing I want to do is make sure that, you know, we don't develop a lost art and don't lose a lost art. And, right. um, yeah, I just, I mean, we currently have a few pieces that are going to be made in Italy um, right now, but they're being made in Italy because it's such a novelty piece and a novelty fabric that, like I said, you know, not a lot of people know how to make certain things over here that the factories, the only people that know how to make it are in Italy. So right. it's, it's one of those things. And I think that's what makes 
our brands stand out more from other brands is because you can't, I mean, the majority of our company, if we did want to manufacture in China, we probably wouldn't be able to because of the quality of the design and the quality of fabrics. They wouldn't be able to know how to work with it because they do primarily like um, fast fashion, easy cottons, jeans, that kind of stuff that anyone can learn how to sew. And so, I mean, it takes our brand and it puts us up on another pedestal on top of it because we're not only limited edition and luxury, but there is only a handful of people that can actually make the garments that we're selling. Right. And you're also, you're paying people for what they're doing. They're, they're knowledgeable. They're working okay. on it. You know, this isn't, and I think this is something that a lot of companies are learning right now is that those prices are really late labor prices that you're paying for that fast fashion to, to pay people properly and what they deserve. That is the cost of fashion. I know there's it, a, a show it is. It's, it's really crazy because you have, um, you have all these human rights activists running around, but they're running around and stuff from Forever 21. And it's like, well, you're only human activists for this, this group of people, but what about the workers in these factories? And that's something that's always been an issue to me is fast fashion. And it's one thing, you know, if, um, you know, everyone has their spending limits, everyone, you know, can only spend so much or what they think they want to spend on a garment. And that's not an issue to me, but you can get pieces that are as, inexpensive as someone from forever 21 and it could be someone at their house you know sewing it themselves not working under those horrible conditions so it doesn't even have to be a pricey garment ours are pricey garments because of our fabrications they're the lo most luxurious fabrics that we use and because of the trade skilled workers are living off of liv livable salaries um but it's just it's an interesting industry uh because there's a lot of like thought process and feelings and you know it's um fashion can get very political but I think one of the things that gets overlooked 24 7 in the fashion is industry is the fact that it is one of the worst uh industries for human rights and when it comes to manufacturing alone because I think only two percent of the world's garments are made in the United States and 80 percent of brands located within the U.S. produce overseas. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, that is a stunning number. And, you know, people have to remember that they vote with their money and their purchases and who they're supporting in businesses. If you support local designers, you know, and I say, let's go a little French. Let's pay a little more for one piece and wear exactly. it over and over. Yeah. I mean, I, I love, I mean, I'm one of those people, and this was since I was young, I never got into, and this is also because I grew up with a mother who had very nice clothes and very nice taste. But once like I was in college and in high school and, you know, working and making a very low, small paycheck, I would still save up and save up and save up for whenever I was in New York or online shopping. And I would wait for it to go like 70% off. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm snagging it now. And then I wouldn't shop for the rest of the year. Like I would save my money and be like, oh, I have to have this like one amazing piece because... I'm also a fashion girl, so it means a lot more to me than it does to, you know, people that don't necessarily care about fashion from their day-to-day -day style. Yeah, and it does mean a lot. I mean, I have no problem. People say, oh, I love that jacket. And I'll say, that's great. You'll see it again soon. Yeah. <laughs> I just keep wearing the same thing over and over. And that's fine, though. I love it, and I love every piece that I have. Um, but and I do, um, you're, you're saving the earth. You're helping people socially. And and before we go on, because we have so much more to talk about, I want to talk about the other celebrity in your family who has their own Instagram, oh. um, Mufasa. <laughs> Is she going to say hello? She will. Oh, my God. She's like, well, what are you doing? She thinks I'm crazy right now because I'm talking to no one. Oh, right. Yeah, that must be very interesting to the dog. It's not the news. It's... <laughs> She's, she just woke up from a nap. She was just laying over there. So... This is Mufasa. She, I have had her since, um, since I was, God, a, uh, since I started my studio, since the day I opened my studio, I got her at eight weeks old and she's been with me in my studio every single day since. Wow. She, you know, and it's so funny because on the Instagram and pictures that I've seen, I really thought she was a lap dog. I thought she was just a little tiny thing. And I'm like, yeah, Golden Doodle, I think they're tiny. Oh, no, she's not tiny. And she's a beautiful girl. 
she's, she's like 30 pounds. Works. You know, she could be bigger. Like she's, she's still like a miniature. She's not a, yeah. 80 pounds like the standards are, but she's, she's fabulous. I love her to death. Um, you know, and animals help so much with stress. I just, I pet my cat all the time. <laughs> yeah. <Love you. laughs> um, London Fashion Week, to go back to all of our fashion talk, um, just had a virtual fashion show in June. Um, Haute Couture's final day is today from Paris. It's all virtual. Starting tomorrow through the 13th is the men's um, Spring Summer 21, and Milan is doing Men's Spring Summer 21 from the 14th to the 17th. Now, we're not allowed, according to the other countries and the way it's looking right now, is we're not going overseas to attend anything. Yeah, so I annoying. Think, I don't think the, I know, I don't think New York Fashion Week is going to happen in September because we can't behave and wear our masks and put on a very nice mask and get one from Kavanaugh. Anyways, um, <laughs> Do you have plans to do a video or a virtual fashion show or maybe a presentation um, for Fashion Week in September? You know, Fashion Week is something that we've always wanted to do, but um, fashion is, and we've discussed this before, is a very uh, pay-to-play game. And someone that's a very small brand, it's very hard for us to pay to play when it comes to fashion weeks that are like the real industry professional fashion weeks instead of like local fashion weeks. Um, so what we're doing this year, uh, since no trade shows are going to be happening, we're doing online trade shows and um, we'll be with, it's a company called New Order and everything's online. And it's a virtual trade show that our stores and our accounts can get on and see the collection. And we will do many videos of the garments itself. So you'll see the garment come in, walk, maybe spin a little bit, show like how it's hanging, if it's flowy, if it's loose, it's a very like stiff fabric, if it's a fitted garment and show the movement. So you have more of an idea since you physically can't touch because part of our big selling point is the touch aspect, the tactical aspect of our garments. And um, we think these videos will help our consumer be able to see the garments and be able to like know more about the garments before they purchase. Um, as for an actual presentation, we'll have our, our typical photo shoot that we always do. And then um, from there, you know, we'll put the videos online once the collections come out for the, the everyday buyer that's our consumer that isn't a boutique to be able to shop and see how the garment moves for themselves. And um, for right now, that's about the most we can do. Um, I don't know if you watched Dior's Couture presentation. It's this amazing, I mean, I, Dior just set the bar for like <laughs> endemic presentations. They did this amazing um, kind of like mini movie. It was 15 minutes and you could really tell the mood of the, of the um, collection and they showed it being made. They made little miniatures, which is very done. It's, very, it's done very often within the industry, especially with couture garments because the price to make them and they made little minis and they take the minis around to these like, I think they were like Greek mythology characters because there was like a mermaid. There was, it looked like there was Aphrodite and all this stuff. And then they go in and they're like showing that they're measuring them and they're picking out which one they want. And then they leave and then they come back and then like the Greek goddesses are wearing the garments like in the woods. And so what they're doing for their top couture clients is they're sending those minis to their clients because they can't have a fashion show for those clients to touch and feel and see a miniature version of the garment for them to place orders off of, which I think is like brilliant with people not being able to come. So I think Dior just set the bar very high for couture brands. So a brand like me, that's a little bit harder to be yeah. able to do, but um, I think that that's a really neat kind of like concept that they're doing. And um, I'm interested to see who else kind of does a similar concept, but for us personally right now, we'll be doing our walking videos to show the garment, to show the movement up close detail, you know, try to give you an idea of the actual weight and texture of the garment. And then um, you'll be able to shop online from there. And I think a picture that I showed earlier, was that a piece from your new collection? It is. So the one that Namatsu was wearing, yeah, I love that dress. So that's actually a piece from our fall collection. 
Um, wow. The collection hasn't been introduced yet to the public. We're about to drop it online for pre-orders. Um, we don't have videos of these because, you know, we developed this collection back in November before any kind of pandemic happened, but we will do videos once we start um, shooting the spring collection to sell, start selling in September. So yeah. we'll, they'll come up first with just um, imagery and then we'll go to videos. But then of course, you know, if you're within the US and you're wanting to travel within the States, our studio is open, our atelier is open, we're accepting clients, we're doing custom. And so clients can come in and touch and feel everything. Wow, that, that's going to be really great. And mm -hmm. I think that piece is so beautiful. And I'm glad that you're going to be able to show it. Um, you know, what do you think the future for fashion shows are um, with everything that's going on, seeing these videos? Do you think it's going to stay a mix? Let's say we get, um, you know, a vaccine. Is everyone just going to go straight back to the way it was? Or is it now going to be mixed with more video and um, fewer live shows? You know, I think that videos are never going to go away because if you've been keeping up with the fashion industry just the past few years, videos have been, many videos have been gearing the fashion industry just for marketing and social media purses because, um, you know, Instagram is so attainable for clients to be able to get on and view. I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, but in the sense of like pandemic with fashion shows, as soon as, you know, everything starts to calm down, fashion shows are going to be back in full swing. People are going to go back to their normal lives. Of course, there's going to be people that are going to be too scared to go back to their normal lives, so they're not going to want to attend. But the majority of the of the world, in my opinion, is going to go back. And I think some people might try to wait on a vaccine, but I think that's a, I think that's a bit of a stretch because let's be honest, there's certain diseases that have been around for like 50 years that they still can't even find a vaccine for. So I, I think that that's just a bit of a stretch. But I don't think anything I think will. Everyone will get creative and, and find ways to move forward the best that they can. Yeah. And I know that with your experience with COVID, um, you'd like to help people who are struggling with um, hospital bills and things, and maybe you're, you're going to come up with something. Is that correct? Is yes. So we're currently that? working on a set of graphic tees, and part of the proceeds will go back. We haven't finalized the, the charity organization or if we're going to develop one of our own. Um, but the money will go back to an organization that helps people pay for their medical bills. Because one thing that I was realizing when I was in the hospital is my medical bills were stacking up and stacking up and stacking up. And you had to do so many tests because like they didn't know what was actually going on. So it was like, well, we're going to try like these five different tests that normally you might get one test. And then since I wasn't having any doctors like willing to look at me, I had to keep going back and forth to the ER with my issues to try to see if someone would finally treat me. And um, I was just like, wow, like my case is bad, but it's not as bad as like a lot of people's cases that they might be getting. So, you know, people that are in the ICU, people that might've been put on ventilators or might have underlying issues that got sick on top of it. I was just like, I can only imagine what, what kind of bills they're racking up. So that was something that as soon as I like mentally got back into like a work and creative field. I was like, this is something I want to do. I want to, you know, kind of tell my story through these t-shirts and then try to help people with it afterwards. Oh, I think that's so important and keep me posted. I will share that with everyone when that happens and how we can support as well, because it's just so, so helpful. There are going to be some big bills. Um, yeah. Kavana, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's really important that young people understand that it may affect them. And you know your body better than anyone. Please get checked if you feel that things aren't right. And um, thank you for coming on Behind Fashion. Yeah, thank you so much. I've had a great time. Thank you. Bye. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for attending this week's Behind Fashion series with Kavana Baker. Kavana's website is www.kavanabaker.com. You can find her designs in her boutique in Nashville, Tennessee, Marielle's boutique in Denver, Colorado, and at Marcus's in Aspen, Colorado, among many others. Next week, I am taking a week's break. Um, on July 22nd, I will be joined by fashion historian, former director and curator of the Union Francaise des Arts du Costume at the Louvre from 1987 to 1993, the ever-amazing Florence Miller. Florence is the appointed director of the textiles and fashion department of the Denver Art Museum. See you all in two weeks.
Wednesday, July 22nd at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, noon on the East Coast, 9 a.m. on the West Coast, and 5 p.m. British Summer Time. All the best to you and yours. Bye. Bye.